Now that Jackson has admitted that he was wrong before, maybe this video will have him finally admit that he was wrong about genetic entropy, mutations, and selection. Will the evolutionists ever admit to the absolute limits of natural selection and mutations? All mutations are invisible to natural selection. Virtually all? Are you kidding me? Because, because they cause it? such a minute change to the organism that natural selection won't see it. Oh my goodness. I can't believe you just... I, actually, you know, I'm not surprised because everything you said has been so absolutely mm -hmm. incorrect. So, that's, that's a this, science fact, a, Jackson. It's not actually... Creationism is not and has never, ever, ever been science. No, Jackson Wheat. Evolution fish to fishermen, bacteria like to biologist evolution has never been nor ever will be scientific. Creationists are the ones winning the war and we are winning it in genetics. These evolutionists like to look to bones found in the dirt, but bones found in the dirt are not inherited. Traits are. We are making testable predictions in the realm of genetics. We are making predictions on DNA function, mitochondrial DNA rates, mitochondrial DNA differences. There are so many predictions that the evolutionists are not even touching on. For example, predictions have been made on the most divergent of African people groups, the Khoisan peoples. Let's see if the evolutionists can match up to the creationists. They can't. This video has proven to you and proven to everybody that evolutionism has been refuted. It's been falsified. Even the best examples that Jackson Wheat can point to are just due to pre-existing genetic adaptation. All organisms have this. Jackson Wheat loves to look to the notothenioid antifreeze arctic fish. They entered cold water and adapted accordingly. This is not the type of change that's gonna take your fish to fishermen. Changes through the breaking down of pre-existing systems or the breaking down or decay of prior and pre-existing information, epigenetic and just general adaptive change, adaptive degeneration, all of these types of changes are not forward evolution. The best beneficial mutations that can be pointed to are destructive. They're degrading. They're not taking things forward. Evolutionists like Jackson Wheat here have failed over and over again to address the key issue, which is net gain versus net loss. Watch my debates with Jackson Wheat. I ask him to explain, to explain away. Give me an explanation for this very key issue of net gain versus net loss and the best he's been able to come up with and that he will point to is what he refers to as a trade-off. But this trade-off is clearly not sustainable. The created heterozygosity model demands the types of changes that we actually observe. But these types of changes will not take your fish to fishermen. So in a nutshell, Jackson Wheat stating that creation has never been scientific nor ever will be scientific He's projecting because it is evolution, evolutionary theory that will never be scientific. Creationists are making the predictions, and this is fact. First of all, evolution is not random. If you're having as much fun as I am debunking the religion of evolutionism, Please subscribe, because we are just getting started. Jackson Wheat has been corrected over and over and over again. If you don't believe me, just go look at my debate on Modern Day Debate, where he gives no valid rebuttal to that of genomic degeneration in the fact that there is no type of natural selection that can stop the degeneration process. This video is going to be quick. If you want to see a full, lengthy, detailed, and very technical debunking of all the numerous claims made by Jackson Wheat, go look at his video titled Evolutionary Predictions and check out our video titled Evolutionary Predictions Debunked. Now, when we look 
to the biblical based model. And when we look to empirical science, they are perfectly consistent. Because the biblical based model predicts death, degeneration, and extinction. This is due to the fall. We would predict that we are going down and not up. Now, if you think of it this way, we have a genome of 3 billion letters. Now, if we were to take out one letter or say change one letter randomly, let me ask you, is there going to be a huge fitness effect? No. The fact is, it's going to have a tiny fitness effect. It's like rust on a car or a single spelling mistake in a book the size of an encyclopedia. You can't see each rust event. You can't see each single spelling mistake, but it's continuous and it's destructive. Selection, which Jackson Wheat clearly does not understand, cannot stop the loss of information that is incredibly and immeasurably complex. Now this is due to low impact mutation accumulation, and this is happening on the molecular level. Selection acts on the phenotype and not the genotype. Selection of course happens on the level of the entire organism. And it is absolutely evident that mutations and natural selection cannot stop the loss of genomic information. That means consequently, and unfortunately for the evolutionist, mutations and natural selection obviously cannot create genomes. Now the facts are clear. Nearly all non-neutral mutations are deleterious. We inherit a multitude of old mutations. Please look at our video titled Mutation Rates because we inherit approximately 100 new mutations per person per generation. Now deleterious mutations, they're pouring in faster than can be removed. And based on what we know about the function of the genome, most mutations are not neutral. They are nearly neutral. And natural selection is constrained by selection interference. Now, Jackson Wheat obviously doesn't understand that the majority of these mutations the fact that they're near neutral, selection cannot see them. They build up relentlessly. He can't show us any form of natural selection that can remove the accumulating mutation. The genetic load is growing. It's a fact. Anybody should be able to see that most mutations fall within a no selection zone and that almost all of them are absolutely deleterious. Even if I gave Jackson Wheat strong selection, this entire zone that I'm talking about can only undergo degeneration. Here's the bottom line. And I've told him this over and over again. The evolutionists, what they'll do, it's an evolutionary tactic is they will commit a confirmation bias fallacy. When faced with the facts and faced with the evidence, they will turn to any type of explanation, no matter how weak or how obvious of a rescue device that it is, just to hold on to their belief in pawn scum to people evolution. Now, outside of this no selection zone, the substantially bad mutations will be selected away, of course. And an occasional rare high impact beneficial will be amplified. That's the bottom line. Selection can amplify the best beneficial mutations and remove the most detrimental and deleterious mutations. But it can do nothing against the influx of near neutral deleterious mutations. These accumulate relentlessly. Now Jackson Wheat, he will look to beneficial mutations. And even if you give him one or two beneficial mutations that truly add new information to the genome, Jackson doesn't understand that it's about net gain versus net loss. And beneficials, 
cannot obviously keep up with deleterious mutations. He can provide us with stories, ideas, beliefs, papers that are attempting to explain the problem, explain to solve the problem, but that's all they are, is stories. Near neutrals are virtually unstoppable. Beneficials cannot keep up with deleterious mutations. This is because the influx of deleterious mutations combined with the fact that beneficial mutations are rare, one or two beneficial mutations are not going to be able to compensate for the information loss. The near neutral mutations are continuously and consistently deleterious. And this is exactly what you'd expect with typographical errors in a text. He also doesn't understand that most beneficial mutations are far too subtle to be selected for by natural selection. I actually explained to Jackson Wheat in our debate on modern day debate that mutations in linkage groups, they're linked basically forever. That means if you have lots of bad mutations in that linkage group and that linkage group is reducing in fitness continuously and this is based on accumulating deleterious mutations, you can throw in one or two beneficials, but they are just going to get neutralized by the large numbers of deleterious ones. There was no, and there has been no rebuttal to this. The linkage is actually an absolute killer and destroyer for evolution. That only makes the problem worse for them. That means that every linkage group is degenerate. Linkage groups can only get worse and more worse. They can't get better. Now, if there are so many beneficial mutations happening in the human population, as Jackson Wheat would assert, selection should be able to amplify them. They should be popping up virtually everywhere. What we know, for the most part, about beneficials is that they're largely reductive. They're due to a loss of information. The breaking down of pre-existing systems. Reductive evolution is what we actually observe. Now, we've all seen evolutionists admit it. Beneficial mutations are rare. They can't compensate for the net loss of information. Natural selection is severely constrained by what is known as selection interference. Selecting for one trait interferes with selecting for another trait. This is why his claims about natural selection are more of talking points, but not actually based on facts. Think about it. When you have billions of traits segregating in the population, then the selection process starts to work against itself, which means you end up with being able to only select the best and worst mutations. Now what Jackson looks to is a trade-off. I have had numerous debates with some of the best evolutionary proponents. Check out my debates, which I will have posted in the description box of this video. Trade-off is what they say. It's been refuted over and over again. What do we know? We know that the genome is degenerating. And although a few nucleotide sites may be improving, massive numbers are being degraded. What does this indicate? Well, this type of trade-off that wheat and other evolutionary proponents look to is not sustainable. This is a fact because it will result in a shrinking functional genome size. So to make it simple, what's going on is that you're throwing out lots of information from lots of nucleotide sites and then you're trying to replace all that information with a single desirable point mutation. Now, most beneficials, as I've stated earlier, they're reductive. Things are not being taken forward. They are degrading. Mutation count mechanism, synergistic epistasis. They're not biologically real. For example, mutation count mechanisms. Simulations have disproven this. Synergistic epistasis. Extensive numerical simulation experiments have falsified this mechanism. And even with the most generous of settings, this mechanism fails to halt deleterious mutation accumulation. To conclude here, the majority of beneficial mutations will escape positive selection. And then the few rare beneficials that Jackson can point to are either due to general adaptation or through a loss and breaking down of pre-existing information. These few beneficials, they'll have a high impact, but these isolated high impact beneficials will only allow for adaptive episodes. These rare anomalies that the atheist can point to, that Jackson Wheat has pointed to and has been corrected on over and over again, they happen 
even while the rest of the genome is undergoing systematic degeneration. Now Jackson thinks that because Kimura's mathematical simulation shows that beneficial mutations can offset the harmful ones, then obviously genetic entropy cannot be true. But this is not the case. Here, let me explain, just so it's easy for everyone. You see, when they noticed that all it took was 2% beneficial mutations to override the deleterious ones, what you should know is that this was not an observation. This was in a mathematical model. So it works in the math because it's an arbitrary number representing no actual beneficial mutation. It's just a number. So to say it's an anti-cancer mutation and it rids the body of cancer, then yes, that one mutation would negate the harmful. But this is obviously not what we see in reality. Think about it like this. Pac-Man is alone in a maze. He represents a beneficial mutation. Life is easy. This would have been original man, or Adam's genome. But the next generation, there are deleterious mutations represented as a ghost. No problem. The genome is huge, and Pac-Man can avoid it easily. Next generation, two ghosts, or two mutations. Still not a problem. However, many generations later, Pac-Man now has a problem, as there are too many mutations, or ghosts, to avoid. So, what they do in the mathematical model is just add another Pac-Man, and poof, the balance is restored. However, what we actually see are mutations everywhere in the human genome, and beneficial mutations are nowhere to be seen to offset any of these. Every known cancer is now linked to a mutation, yet not a single beneficial mutation can counter even one of these. And these so-called neutral mutations that these evolutionists keep referring to are not passive, dormant, or dead mutations. They cause disease and harm, contrary to whatever he may think or believe. What he thinks happens is irrelevant. It's what we see that matters, and de novo mutations do cause disease. And for beneficial mutation to offset the harmful ones, it has to be extremely beneficial to override the harmful. So just as strong as the deleterious cancer-causing mutation is, therefore there would have to be a beneficial mutation at the same level to counterbalance things, and there is not. So who cares what Jackson blathers on about to his sheep audience? So in closing, this is why Kimura's mathematical simulation is a failure and unrealistic when compared to the real-world test. This is why John Sanford said Kimura would have drawn a diagram the same way he did. Because observational science shows the exact opposite of the mathematical simulation. And who would know better? Someone in the field longer than even Jackson has been alive with over 70 peer-reviewed published studies on the subject? But we all know he will probably hold firm to the assumption rather than the evidence. It's what evolutionists do best to rationalize the belief that they hold on to.